If you look around our rural areas, you'll recognize that the tribes of Oregon have been part of the economic drivers of our community. I mean, they are there to stay. They are going to figure out how to make it work for the people of their particular tribe. But more importantly, they're there to make it better for the entire community. And um, when you start working together, you start recognizing how much we have in common. Um, and the state of Oregon has a unique program um, in that uh, Governor Atia, a Republican many years ago who passed away recently, um, came up with the idea of a, a standing commission, the Education Commission on Indian Services. And um, it has its own room in the Capitol. Actually, it has its own room in the Capitol better than the governor has a room, because we let, r rent it out to the governor. But um, Legislative Commission Indian Services has their own space. Um, and we bring all nine tribes together. There are two senators, one from each party, and two House members, one from each party, who are also on the Legislative Commission on Indian Services. And I think through conversations, we also decided that there are a lot of non-represented tribes in Oregon. And there's a health group, NAYA, out of uh, Portland. And so they have a membership on the board, so we get different conversations. And over the last number of years, um, the, the House, the Senate uh, Republican leader um, and myself have been the two uh, Senate members. And we've cooperated with our tribes and through the commission come up with a lot of legislation um, regarding Native Americans and how, how do we work together with our tribes. Um, this one, one of the landmark ones that came right at the end of the session um, to get the money for it. Um, we, we, we came to the conclusion that education for our, our citizens of Oregon and our public schools need to be a more accurate understanding of what the tribes have been giving and have been doing for Oregon for a long time. So we have um, some money for each tribe to develop a curriculum about who they are, where they have been, how long they have been there if they want to talk about it, and to start developing curriculum that will go into every school in the state. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about that one. There's some people here who were instrumental in making that happen. And so I just wanted to give you a slight introduction about what we're doing. And I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to a person who impressed me a lot, um, came to the Rules Committee to have a conversation. Um, and she ended up, um, I kept saying, why is my old student from North Bend here? Um, <laughs> and it turns out they got married. Uh, he was a tribal <laughs> member of the Coquills, Mr. Yeah. Yonker. Um, and so it has been interesting to watch and see and recognize um, the power and, of, of these different peoples. There was a conference just last week of which uh, uh, Durrell was a major p contributor in. Um, what's the initials? I, uh, the AT&I. AT&I. Yes. AT&I. Uh, so we talked about that. And one of my goals over the next few years as President of Penwar, um, Dan Ashton, who was the president last time, wanted to start getting the First Nations involved in Penwar. I, my goal is to figure out how to get our tribes um, engaged, because Penwar is about the economic vitality of the Pacific Northwest. And I will tell you that there isn't any part of the Pacific Northwest that isn't Indian country. So we need to have conversations with um, our partners uh, to have, a, I think, to help make Penware stronger as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Darrell, um, who you will find out is also a brilliant woman. Um, and so don't get in an argument with her. Uh, <laughs> so with that, thank you for being here. Um. Well, thank you. Thank you, and good morning, or in my tribal language, Uh My name's Darrell Kalika. I'm a citizen of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. I'm um, of tribal descent from Warm Springs. I'm also Wasco, Malala, um, Snoqualmie. I also have relatives at Tulalip. So my family kind of made a nice uh, Pacific Northwest loop. So in terms of my connection to the Northwest, I have a vast one. But uh, I'm here today, you know, moderating this particular panel as um, Senator Roblin just mentioned last week we are fresh off of having finished up our affiliated tribes and Northwest Indians uh, Energy and Economic Development uh, Summit here in Portland, Oregon at the McMinimins Kennedy School. We had a uh, hundred plus uh, tribal representatives as well as folks from the economic development sector and the energy and utility sector. So the other hat I'm here wearing, which is a new one, is, uh, the, is that of the director of the Institute for Tribal Government at the Hatfield School at Portland State University. 
University. So I'll be kind of here in that in those dual roles. But what I wanted to do is one, we're going to get started with this panel, and a little bit of the structure of this panel is going to be I'm going to have them introduce themselves briefly um, to go down the line, so you get to know who they are, and then we'll circle back and do allow allow ten minutes for them to talk about what it is that they're doing and working on um, with relation to the region, economic development, um, energy, which that's kind of my area, um, as well as sort of the uh, sector of environmental entrepreneurship. Tribes have a deep connection to being good stewards of the land, so a lot of that in terms of economic development is balancing the uh, stewardship responsibilities that we have um, as tribal people, but also in terms of providing economic revenue and stimulating tribal economies. And that's really been kind of the theme of our summit last week was developing and stimulating tribal economies. What does that mean and defining those? Helping reservation economies, which are really rural economies, um, cycle their resources, cycle the dollars back into those communities. Because often the vast majority of tribes, those the, the financial resources go off and external to the reservation services and what have you are off reservation. So we're really working to try to generate um, those resources um, within tribal communities. So that, that's a bit of part of what we're doing. And then we'll reserve the last 30 minutes of this panel because it is 90 minutes to um, question and answers from all of you as uh, they, our panelists go through their presentations. I'm sure it's going to stimulate thoughts and questions um, amongst you. So we'll reserve that time for, for that. But what I'd like to do, we have such a distinguished panel, I don't think I could do justice to introducing all of them other than knowing that I have some um, longtime friends on this panel and colleagues who've been there um, throughout my work and career, as well as some new friends that I'm going to be making in terms of the future of some of the work that uh, I'm working on for the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians and for my role at the Hatfield School. But before I hand this over, I do want to ask a couple questions of all of you. So do you know which bridge in the city of Portland is named after the Tillicum or the, I just gave the answer away. <laughs> I'm going to give a harder question then. So what tribe in Oregon um, is named after smelt? You should know this one. All right. So he already mentioned it. So does, does anybody have an answer? It was kind of given away in his introduction. Anyone? Yes. Yes, Coquel. <laughs> Scockwell is actually the uh, word for uh, smelt, but that's how the Coquel Indian tribe got their name. So another question. What is the Indian name for Mount Hood? Yes. Yes. Well, great. We've got a lot of folks here that um, some have some familiarity with their tribal languages. So, um, so just to kind of get us going, I'm going to start with our panel here and let them introduce themselves, where they are from, and a brief background that if they want to share. But then we'll go into the longer spiel um, after the introduction. So I'm going to start first with our Madam Chair. <laughs> OK. Good morning. My name is Dolores Pigsley, and I'm chairman of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. I've been chairman for many years, too long. Uh, we need change, just like every place else in Oregon and the nation. Um, I am elected for a three-year term. Every, every three years, every year we elect three people on our tribal council. We have 5,000 tribal members, and uh, Portland, Oregon is part of our uh, historical uh, area. We have uh, 11 counties that we provide services in, and uh, we were uh, terminated tribe and restored in 1977 by the Carter administration. So today I'll be sharing with you um, some of the things that we do over on the coast and how we came back to being a uh, tribe that had to purchase land back because we were restored without any uh, reservation and, and any services. So we're a comeback from the from nothing tribe to where we are today, and I'll be sharing that story with you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm State Washington State Senator John McCoy, 38th Legislative District, which is uh, the Tulalip Indian Reservation, cities of Marysville and Everett. 
and I am a uh, Tulalip citizen. Um, my background is uh, the uh, technology, uh, the Air Force, and I, I was in the Air Force for 20 years, and uh, in its infinite wisdom, they put me in computers in 1965. <laughs> so um, I've uh, done a lot of things. Uh, was part of a lot of uh, historical uh, activity in regards to the technology. Um, and my tribe asked me to come home in uh, 93, of which in 94 I met Chair Pigsley. So uh, you can figure out at least how long or greater than that she's been chair. Um, but the tribe asked me to come home do economic development. And so uh, that's what I did. And through traversing through history, uh, I wound up in the legislature 15 years ago and uh, done a number of things um, for the great state of Washington and tribes. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to be part to participate in this panel. My name is Amber Schultz Oliver. I'm a Yakima and Wasco descendant. I'm executive director of the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians Economic Development Corporation, which is a sister organization of AT&I. Uh, I've been in this position for just over a year, so I'm still sort of in the I'm out of the deer and headlights phase and into the um, getting my feet under me phase. AT&I serves 57 tribes in the Pacific Northwest, which includes all of the tribes in Oregon, all of the tribes in Washington, and all of the tribes in Idaho, as well as some tribes in Northern California, Nevada, Montana, and Alaska. And that's all I can think about right now. I'd like to talk about what we're doing in terms of economic development. Um, like I said, I've only been here for about a year, so um, I'm, I'm just learning about what opportunities are before us. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Bruce Zimmerman, and I'm the tax administrator for the Umatilla Indian Reservation out in eastern Oregon. Um, you wonder what taxes have to do with economic development. Um, for our tribe, how we're organized is my, my program, the taxes, which is both uh, compliance as well as we have our own tax system there. I'm in the Department of Economic and Community Development. I spend approximately half or more of my time working on economic development ventures and analysis of various projects. Um, an integral part of that is also right away issues, uh, land leases and land acquisition uh, analysis and, and programs. And um, I've, I've been with the tribe since 1996, so I've been there quite a while. So I've seen the, the start of the, the growth out there. When, the, when I first went to work there, they had just started the casino to where it is today and the other development ventures that are out there. Uh, prior to that time, I was with the Oregon Department of Revenue where I worked in their valuation section, mainly dealing with industrial and utility properties where I actually ran the utility assessment program for the state for a number of years. So I do greatly appreciate the opportunity to come and meet and talk about economic development and the challenges we all face. Um, I, I am very appreciative to talk with a group that is uh, on the coast and situated in rural areas. They face a number of similar challenges that we do. So I think it'll be a great discussion. Thank you again for allowing me to come here. Hi, my name is Mark McMullen. Uh, I've served as the Oregon State Economist for the past six years. Uh, as State Economist, uh, my prime directive is the statewide economic and revenue forecast for the legislature to help build their budgets. And so I come with a little different perspective than most of the folks on this panel. I'll be do it, taking a 30,000 foot view, just looking at some broad indicators of population and, and employment and things across tribes to, to see what's going on with recent performance and, and talk about some of the challenges going forward. Good morning. I'm Jim Paul, a director with the Department of State Lands. 
Uh, I'm going to be, uh, my remarks are going to be focused around the collaboration with states in natural resource management side of the rural economic development topic. I've been the director for uh, only about a year and a half, coming up on my year and a half mark, where I've been in state government for over 20 years uh, in the natural resource management uh, arena, starting with the uh, Department of Forestry the first 14 years of my career, and I've been with the Department of State Lands uh, since 2010. Uh, I will also be coming from a little bit of a different angle. We are, um, uh, than the rest of the panelists, we're a relatively small agency. However, we have, I would say, a disproportionately high number of activities uh, that involve engagement and collaboration with the tribes. And that is in part to do with a very diverse uh, set of uh, responsibilities that we have, uh, despite being a relatively small agency. So I'll be talking, touching a little bit on uh, those issues as well. And thank you for uh, the opportunity to be here. So thank you. So as you can see, we have a really diverse panel and representation in terms of folks that have touch points on tribal economic development. And you have on this panel uh, a section of folks that, you know, we have Chairwoman Pigsley, who is an elected tribal leader um, leading the, her tribe and nation, Senator McCoy, who is a, also a tribal citizen but a state elected official. Um, Amber is a lead of the regional intertribal organization. So we have several in the country, but we have probably one of the, the second oldest here in the Pacific Northwest. And then we also have Bruce, who is there working with uh, his tribe and plays an important role. So you get the perspective of working um, inside the tribal organization. And then we also have uh, Jim and uh, Mark, who represent the state side, but also, you know, in terms of one, the relationship that tribes have with our, our state agencies, and also the role that that the state agencies play in terms of supporting tribal economic development. So one of the things I do want to kind of just take a, a brief step back and just, you know, reiterate and underscore the fact that tribes are sovereign nations with the ability to control and have jurisdiction over their resources and assets. So what may fit for one tribe doesn't always fit for another tribe. It depends on, one, their, their sovereign um, status, their organic documents as a tribe, their land and resources, and their sort of cultural fundamentals and principles that are important implemented and how they uh, perform and, and do their economic development. So uh, as we go through, I'm going to go ahead and we'll let each of the panelists tell their story um, briefly, and then we'll go into Q&A afterwards. So again, we'll start on this end um, with Chairman Pigsley. Thank you. Well, good morning again. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank Senator Roblin and Rosie for all the work you do to put this conference on every year. It's been, I know, huge. Uh, and we've had these meetings, the caucuses and tribal casinos and tribal lands. And so we uh, have had a great opportunity to share issues with the state and with the people that attend the caucus. And to begin with, uh, I mentioned that our tribe was terminated in the 1950s and restored in 1977 under the Carter administration. We were restored without any money or any resources. We had to borrow money from other tribes to establish programs in the Northwest region. And we really started without any land base. Um, the most money we had when I first got elected back in 1975 was $75. And then we collected that in a coffee can after we had a general council meeting. And so I feel really blessed to have represented our tribe for, for many, many years. Uh, it's been a, a huge job. We had to establish a, a membership role, a constitution, and a land base. And eventually, we got 6,000 acres returned from uh, the federal government. It was BLM lands. And it was mountaintops that um, there were trees on most of the mountaintops, but not all of them. And so that was the beginning of um, any kind of economic development for the tribe was processing the timber and figuring out ways to access timber on lands that um, we had to buy right of ways. Uh, federal government never made any money on the sale of timber on those lands, and we had to figure out how to do that, which we did. And so 
uh, with the land base, we were able to start some programs, but soon after uh, restoration, we became um, a self-governance tribe back in 95 after it was approved by Congress. And since then, we've managed under um, being a self-governance tribe, which means that we contract for all the funds that are, are due the tribe and we're able to hire our own members and establish our own rules for how we, how we manage programs. One of the best things that happened to us was when we built uh, the casino on the coast, Chinookwins Casino Resort. And it came at a time when it was fairly difficult to get a casino that was not considered on the reservation. We were able to do that with a lot of help from our uh, legislative uh, friends in Washington, D.C. And that's to say we're not just about casinos, but it was the casino revenues that helped us to establish programs to establish many, many of the, the benefits that uh, provide services to tribal members, but it also provides a great service to the state of Oregon and to Lincoln City, the, in Lincoln County. And our purchases just from the casino to uh, for the services in at, at Chinook Winds is 2.8 million just in Lincoln County, and we purchase services in the state of Oregon that total around $23 million. So it's not only been a blessing to us, it's been a blessing uh, to the community. And we're not just about casinos. Um, we're in a rural area, there's many impediments to uh, the things that we do, transportation, Housing is uh, a critical area. Right now we have uh, probably 30 to 40 openings at the casino that we can't fill because there's no place to live. Uh, when you buy land on the coast, you buy land on the coast. <laughs> and it's either lake frontage or ocean view or river frontage and so it comes at a hefty price. And this is land that was really former reservation. And it's become um, difficult in some of the winter months when the roads cave in uh, on the highways to the coast. And so we look forward to some of the new transportation money from not only the state, but hopefully from the feds to fix some of those uh, roads that when they cave off, particularly the one from uh, Salem to the coast, it takes another extra hour to get there on alternate highways. So we really are um, blessed to be where we are and in the state of Oregon, and we're blessed to have the relationship that we have with our, our state senators and, and legislators and our governor. And for those of you who don't know, our governor served on the Commission on Indian Services for many years. And so she's been very supportive of what tribes do, as well as the other members on the Commission on Indian Services. So we're happy that we have that support. And just to share a few numbers with you, right now we, uh, we've purchased timberlands. We have about 15,000 acres that we manage on a sustained yield basis. We cut two and a half million board feet a year and that provides funding to help our seniors pay for their Medicare premiums and to provide a small stipend for those that are eligible. We do lots of activities on the river and we've gotten funds, lots of grants to uh, study stream habitat, uh, eel habitat, and forest lands and some on climate change, which is being denied by some folks, but we know that it's important and we know that our future is going to depend on the amount of water we have, the kind of water we have, and the air that we breathe. Through our charitable funds, we give 
a lot of dollars, and I, I won't bore you with the numbers, but the kinds of uh, services that we provide for in our awards is uh, field and stream habitat purchases, um, money for high school students to learn about the industry, development of a draft plan for the reintroduction of the sea otter to the Oregon coast, um, sea otter research, Yaquina Bay Scenic Byway, Respite Area, environmental lecture series, supplying GIS mapping software and, and licensing, and lots of kids activities to get them interested in uh, the work that happens on the coast and in the environmental areas. We give a lot of money to schools so that we can get students interested in in uh, working in the kinds of uh, jobs that we provide on the coast. And we provide college and tuition for every single tribal member that wants to go to college. We pay for their um, college and we pay for uh, computers, laptops, so that they can be successful in their efforts to um, better their lives and to better our lives. And so we are a very proud tribe, proud to be in Oregon and proud to have the support that we have from the state. And we look forward to working with all of the agencies, the state agencies as well as federal agencies. And with the city uh, of Lincoln City, the city of Salettes, we do a lot of um, communication and, and we talk about the issues that face us, not only as a tribe, but as just people in Oregon that live on the coast. And remember, it's always better at the beach. <laughs> I'm just going to interrupt really quick. I just wanted to encourage, there's, there's some seats up here for folks in the back that would like to sit down. So if you want to, come on up. So. Good morning again. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to uh, give you a little more context to my background, um, I mentioned that the Air Force put me in computers in 1965, uh, which was the ground floor of the government getting into computers. Um, and, uh, and like I said, <clears throat> I was uh, involved in some historical uh, uh, activity, uh, one of which was uh, when we launched Telstar, the first communication satellite, I was on the test team that tested the capability of that satellite. Then on my birthday in 1969, um, between the uh, government and research universities and, and others, uh, there's this little activity that was launched called ARPANET. Today it's called the Internet. So uh, that was a, a fabulous time. Had had a lot of fun with that. Um, so <clears throat> when I came home, and then in um, during Ronald Reagan's first term, the company I was with had the contract to automate the White House. The White House was uh, manual operation, and we took it from manual to automated operation. And my particular area of responsibility was the Situation Room. And um, <clears throat> looking at today's White House, well, I was there in that Situation Room when, when uh, air traffic control was basically fired. And then um, Ollie North and the Contra deal. Um, I thought it was chaotic then, but I think it was a walk in the park compared to what's going on today. <clears throat> so, um, but anyway, my tribe asked me to come home and um, do economic development. And, uh, you know, that was a pretty big challenge. You know, I, I didn't, um, 
I hadn't done things like that before, you know, in in having to worry about all all the infrastructure and everything. But um, sitting down, thinking about it logically, and working with uh, civil engineers, it, it was um, it was a task that could be accomplished. So. Um, I agreed to do the job, so in December 93, um, I left my company in D.C. and uh, came home. And I get home, and, um, you know, starting to, to look at what it's going to take to bring economic development to Tulalip. Well, uh, for those that don't know where Tulalip is, we're north of I Seattle on I-5. Our east boundary is I-5, and our west boundary is the Salish Sea. Okay? So, and then we have Marysville, and we have Everett right there. Um, well, I was totally frustrated because when I got home, the best I could get out of my home was dial-up. Well, I left dial-up in the 80s. <laughs> and here it was, you know, in the early 80s, I left dial-up. And now here it is, the middle 90s, and all I could get was dial-up. So you can imagine how frustrated I was. So I convinced the tribe on its own dime because we tried to get grants from, from the Gates Foundation. Didn't want to, didn't, didn't want to deal with us. Uh, the FCC and all the grants that they do could not get a penny because it wasn't financially feasible. They couldn't make money. Well, <clears throat> my message out to Indian country today, you can't use telecommunications as a profit center. It's a utility. And it must be treated as a utility. And so in order to get any kind of economic development, you need the internet. Well, most tribes are in the rural areas. In the state of Washington, we have 29 tribes. There are some tribes that don't have internet. They're lucky if they get dial-up. So how are they gonna do economic development? We're always told, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But then again, we get all these little barriers that get in our way. So, so I convinced Tulalip to uh, put the money up to bring the internet to the reservation. So as what I did, I worked with Everett Community College and the University of Washington and got them to bring the internet to Tulalip. By using the students out of the classes, Yes, it took longer. Yeah, I could have hired some company that could have got it in there in six months, but at a big price tag. And so by using the students and taking three years to accomplish it, it was one-fourth the cost. And every student that worked on that program got a job on the day of graduation because they could point to an actual project they worked on. And that was approximately 1,200 students. So by combining and working with the local education network, we were able to accomplish that. Today, uh, Tulalip um, has its broadband company, uh, telephone company. Um, so it's doing quite well. But 
None of the economic development would have happened without it. Had to have it. Because as we were building our new casino and having gotten the internet in, um, we uh, um, double wired it so that we had the uh, redundancy. Um, I'm sitting in my office um, and this stranger comes in, cold call, and he said, we've been watching you and we want to come in uh, to your reservation. And so I said, who are you? And uh, they said, the Chelsea Group. And I said, well, who's the Chelsea Group? Don't have any idea. Well, they're the premium outlet malls. And they said they'd been watching us for a year, and they liked what they seen, what we were doing. And so now they're on our reservation. They opened the same week as the casino did. Um, it first opened at uh, 100 stores, then it went to 110 stores, now it's 135 stores. And, um, but prior to that, I also convinced the tribe to, uh, to do a, um, a study and to find out what it is that would bring people to the reservation. So we had a, um, a survey done that went from North Vancouver, British Columbia, all the way down to Tacoma. And we asked, what would bring you to the reservation, plus a number of other things that, that were uh, items of interest. But is what came out of that poll is number one, they wanted to know about our culture. Number two, shopping. Then number three was the casino. Casino came in third. So tribes have to work at to figure out what will bring people in. And number one is that you got to have the internet. You don't have the internet, they're not going to come. So today, and um, I strongly suggest to tribes, is that we need to start working with whomever will work with us to bring fiber to the reservation. And then the tribe needs to, because it needs to be handled as a utility, create an intranet that they deliver the services that's required to their membership as a utility. So, uh, so you reduce the expenses off the telecom folks because they don't have to worry about individual homes or individual businesses on the reservation. Let the tribe do that. Then the tribe can train their members to be those providers. And so they're getting high tech training. So that's what needs to be done. And so that's what I'm telling tribes that that's what they need to do. So, and then uh, besides that utility, tribes also need to be their own power utility. They, and they need to get into alternative energy. Um, some of the coastal tribes uh, in Washington, we got three tribes that got to move their villages because they're going to uh, get hit with the water. So they got to move their villages. So um, they need to bring in their, be their own power utility. Because they're, they're, they have diverse needs and they should use all the technologies that are out there. Wind, solar. Um, got a great briefing on, uh, on uh, tidal technology uh, the other day. So. Tribes need to be involved in that. 
Now, tribe, individual tribes, they're not big enough to do that by themselves. They need help. And that's where I also ask tribes, think about a number of tribes getting together and creating that utility so you get the bang for the buck. <clears throat> so that's my suggestion. Um, the entire communities in and near reservations, um, it's well documented that when a tribe succeeds, all the surrounding communities succeed. So we need to partner on all these endeavors with our surrounding folks. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Pigsley and Senator McCoy for sharing your stories. As I mentioned in my introduction, I've been the executive director of at and EDC for just about a year. The thing I didn't mention is I'm a one-woman shop. <laughs> um, so how does one person get their arms around trying to provide economic development assistance to 57 tribes? Well, I took this challenge, and what we've been doing for the past year is working on creating our comprehensive economic development strategy. We have a planning grant with the Economic Development Administration, and um, we've been hosting a series of visioning workshops, and we also have a survey out to at and member tribes. And what we know about this strategy is two things. It's going to be pretty high level to be able to meet the needs of 57 mem member tribes. And it's also going to take a two-pronged approach, one where we assist tribes with individual economic development efforts, and another where we start exploring um, how do we build an intertribal economy. So let me talk a little bit about the um, workshops we've been hosting. Um, I've hosted two economic development visioning workshops. And the first one was just trying to keep the world open. What do we want to see in the future? What do we want to see in 20 years? And what came back was things like children can always come home. Children still find value in their culture. And when I asked to try and pull some elements of an economic development visioning uh, statement together, that what a vision statement might look like, we came up with five elements. Indian economy building model, sovereignty, sustainability, entrepreneurship, and the old way. We've gone about this by asking questions like, is your community happy? And what is the definition of wealth? In tribal communities, is wealth monetary? So this has all been a very interesting uh, exploration. I feel like um, over the past year, I've been gathering these separate puzzle pieces. Um, I'm not quite sure yet to what to make of them, um, but I have the next year to try and put that together into something that's going to be um, pretty cohesive. The other thing we do is we have a revolving loan fund to support tribal entrepreneurs gain access to capital. As you know, healthy economies uh, experience um, a robust private sector. But there's a lot of barriers for natives to enter uh, or to start their own businesses. What are the primary ways of getting capital to start your own business? You can mortgage your house. You can tap into your rich uncle. Um, or you can get a loan that's based on a strong credit, um, strong credit history. Well, unfortunately, a lot of uh, community members in our, on our reservations don't have access to these assets. So we provide loans to entrepreneurs to be able to help build the private sector on reservation. Um, in a healthy economy, the dollar circulates about seven times, but in reservation communities, it only circulates about once. So being able to provide goods and services on reservation to keep those dollars within our community is important for developing our economies. And that's pretty much all I've been doing for the past year. Um, it, it's actually kind of a lot. <laughs> um, 
And I'm, I look forward to pulling together our strategy and being able to share that with you um, the next time we have an opportunity to meet. Thank you. Thank you for, again, allowing me to briefly um, talk a little bit about our economic development um, challenges that we face. And we are in rural Oregon. Um, we face a number of, of, of unique challenges that the metro area doesn't face. Um, transportation is, is one, and um, another is workforce. We don't have a large population and population density to draw from. Um, the other is what I call basic infrastructure needs. And we've talked about the fiber optic communication systems and just the backbones is that that is one of our, our barriers to economic development. We just do not have the capacity that is existing on the current systems out there to handle the demand that we're currently experiencing. And the other is electricity, electricity distribution. We have huge transmission lines running through our reservation yet the substations do not service us. And so we, we have a problem in getting enough power off those big, powerful Bonneville transmission lines that run through our reservation, getting them to step it down to where we can utilize that power. So we, we kind of have uh, utility, and I, I like the term utility, that's the way we view it, utility services issues and limitations. But I also want to talk a little bit about some of our successes that we've had and one of those successes I view is a partnership that we have formed with the state of Oregon in trying to overcome some of these barriers. Um, I, I've been around there uh, quite a while and um, it, one of the unique partnerships that, that I think really started was back in 2001 when Warm Springs uh, through Michael Mason and, and we had a number of discussions with the state legislatures uh, about creating what we called the reservation enterprise zone. In Oregon, they have enterprise zones to encourage economic development. Well, we were looking at how do we encourage those same incentives or benefits to attract economic development in rural areas. And so what was created in the 2001 legislature was the reservation enterprise zone program. And I view that as a tremendous success and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. Because when you look at economic development, one of the key things is risk and uncertainty. Those are the two components that developers really look at. How can I mitigate my risk? And how can I take uncertain situations and make them certain so that I can eliminate that, that question mark? And in working on the reservation enterprise zone provided some incentives, but it was just one step of many. There's been several other uh, key pieces of legislation that, that has gone through that, that has kind of helped knock down that uncertainty. Um, one was, um, I refer to it as the uh, Essential Governmental Services Bill. It was back in 2012. There was some legislation that went through that the tribes were very supportive of that exempted the tribes when we started building infrastructure of course, when we build that infrastructure on fee lands, it becomes taxable. And so here you have us trying to extend municipal type utility services out on fee lands and we're paying Oregon property taxes, which cause an extra burden. And what, what the state of Oregon did was they said, if we locate property on fee lands that is providing governmental services, and it was broadly defined, um, those would be exempt from property taxes. So again, you take a barrier down and remove it. Um, there is some issues still still there. there. There are some components we would like to add. Uh, two of the components that were omitted from utility services were communication services and electricity. And so we'd still like to follow up on that. Um, one of the other things is whenever you're dealing with multiple sovereigns or multiple jurisdictions, the issue of taxation is, is always comes up who has what right to tax, or if both jurisdictions have concurrent taxing jurisdiction, how does that work? And in the reservation enterprise zone legislation, there is an Oregon income tax credit 
that the state allows for a dollar for dollar income tax credit for tribal taxes that are imposed on those businesses located uh, within those zones. And when we started laying that out for people that were um, looking at doing development on reservations, they said, oh, that's like paying taxes to a, uh, a foreign entity. And so, you know, Oregon offers a credit for that. And so they, that's the analogy they were kind of drawing, and it made sense to them. But what it really did was it provided some tax certainty. Another major piece of legislation that went through, and this was... Um, in 2015, it's often referred to as the Chehalis case, where the federal courts and federal law clarified what is taxable on trust land that is operated and owned by non-Indians or leased by non-Indians versus, versus Indians. And it basically said that real property improvements are an integral part of the land and therefore are exempt. But what we found out in talking with developers was that was not sufficient they wanted to know what was the state of Oregon's policy on that. And so the state legislature clarified it and codified that into it. And so now we have removed uncertainty. Developers look at the state statute and they see what is the Oregon policy on this issue. And it's very clear and very helpful. So my real message today is that as, as a sovereign tribal nation, we really need to look outward and we need to form those partnerships with the uh, local governments, the counties, and the cities. But even more importantly, we need to look to the state of Oregon and build those bonds and say, what is it that's causing problems and how do we address those in the most expeditious manner that provides certainty to everybody? Thank you. Hi, thanks. So uh, again, I'm the numbers guy, so from the 30,000 foot view, uh, you know, of at least Oregon's tribes, which I'm most familiar with, uh, is that the, the tribes are growing, really, in terms of what we're seeing in the population and the economic data and the jobs data and the like, uh, particularly the population data. That's really what jumps off the page, but it's kind of quirky right now. But nevertheless, uh, there's significant growth when we look at the at the census microdata for, for our tribes. Over the last 10 years of, of census data, here in Oregon, we saw uh, people who uh, self-identify as white, non-Hispanic folks that the growth in that, in that population cohort was about a little over 5% over the last 10 years. Whereas uh, folks that identify as uh, Native American we've, in Oregon, we've seen that grow by almost twice as much, 9% over the last 10 years. So uh, pretty, pretty big, and if we include uh, folks who also identify as Hispanic, it becomes even uh, more extreme, where uh, uh, white Hispanic uh, folks are white, Hispanic, and non-Hispanic folks uh, have grown at about 8% in Oregon over the last decade, where tribal folks, if you include those that self-identify as Hispanic, have grown by a whopping 30% over the last decade. So what's going on, right? Some of it is uh, fundamental population growth uh, like we're used to, in, in, insofar as uh, tribal communities tend to not have as big of a baby boom or bulge. And so in recent years, those death rates have been lower among, among tribal communities than the average uh, Oregonian. But that said, <clears throat> a lot of it is coming from uh, folks who are now identifying uh, with a tribe who weren't previously. Uh, who, because in the census data, it's all your your race is self-identified, and uh, there's quite a flood of folks now uh, identifying with with the tribes. A part of this has to do, they say, with uh, new genetic testing uh, technology that's cheap for everybody, and some folks are finding out their heritage, and other folks uh, are also uh, being drawn by the culture and, and want to identify with with it. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this shakes out for the Oregon tribes, how many of these local tribes, to what extent are they uh, experiencing some of this, uh, some of these gains in folks that, that identify a, as such. Uh, we won't know until the 2020 census when we start to get in a little bit deeper. Uh, 
for for me this is an opportunity to always pitch uh we need more money into the census uh in the 2010 uh round of it oregon kind of got beat up by other states in terms of other states putting more resources into trying to find their un their difficult to measure populations which turns into millions of federal dollars in the end if you can if you can identify your some of these hard to reach populations which the census does and, and given that uh, you know we're we're in a world with a federal war on knowledge right now it would probably be the state funding for this would probably be even more important than ever so well, what about jobs? Well, we're, the population growth is obviously there. What about jobs? Well, it sure looks like it. We don't get good, timely data on uh, the jobs within the sovereign nations, but we do, as has been mentioned here a couple times already, we do notice a real close tie between the local communities surrounding, uh, surrounding tribes. And so we can get a kind of an idea of what's going on in job markets by looking at the surrounding areas. So how did I do that? I define a tribal county in Oregon as one where you have at uh, more than uh, one out of 40 of your residents are uh, self-identify as uh, being members of a, of a tribe. And so looking at that, our, our tribal counties are doing quite well. Over the last two years, these tribal counties have averaged 2.5% uh, year-over-year employment gains, which is about as good as it gets. These aren't our high-flying counties in Oregon when we're talking about, you know, Sherman County and Lincoln County and Wasco and, and whatnot. These aren't necessarily always our, our fastest growers, but we certainly have seen a lot. Uh, well above not just the national average for rural areas, but the overall natural, national average as well. And so this is encouraging, and uh, we've seen a ton of diversification starting to happen, some really interesting manufacturing going on and transportation projects with these tribes we have maritime stuff we have you know t drone testing on on the reservations all sorts of things that, and oh and the and the clean energy uh, and all sorts of things that are really opening up uh, you know more diversity and and, and you know uh, a broader economic base and even gaming is is doing well you know gaming has certainly come back in the last couple of years and uh in oregon our lottery that we follow closely is all the way back to its pre-recession highs in las vegas it's it's almost back and we've seen a lot of growth so that's that's encouraging particularly in the last couple of years however going forward it, it it's it's likely that that pie is not going to grow very much you know the the tribes in the state and all the other uh, wildly competitive places you can come and gamble or, or game it may you know shift who gets part of that pie but the pie itself is not growing like it used to although we're back to pre-recession uh, peak levels in terms of gaming spending uh, we're a lot bigger economy now than we were then and so for the Oregon part of it which I follow closely with a video lottery and the like back before the recession uh, the average Oregonian we're spending about video lottery sales were about 0.6 percent six tenths of a percent of oregon's income so a little bit more than a half a percent they were spending on on video lottery now we're down uh we really haven't come back very much since the recession we're looking at about 0.4 percent so you know we've dropped that share by a third and there's a lot of like i say there's a competitive environment with a lot of places to go spend your gaming dollar in addition with our aging population we're seeing uh less demand for gaming so going forward you know we expect it to grow with the growing economy but roughly you know the same size pie a as we have today and so finally uh at a time you know with uh, challenges and uh opportunities as has been mentioned it's really uh with a lot of our tribes in oregon at least it's the rural development issues just even cranked up another notch so we're talking about infrastructure and telecommunications and transportation and, and education and, uh, of course, housing. And, and housing is one that might bear a, a couple more sentences on it because it is really, uh, really pronounced uh, for our tribes. Uh, housing, is, housing affordability is a problem across the rural Pacific Northwest, with the exception of a couple of our Canadian provinces that we have here today. But for at least the U.S., it's, it's across the rural U.S., across the rural Pacific Northwest, we have really issues with housing affordability and, and access. That's even more pronounced for tribes. 
uh, in Oregon as a whole, about 61% of our housing stock is owner occupied. When we're talking about uh, households that identify as, as tribal members, it, that drops down to 45% of owner occupied housing. And so, uh, so not only do you have the same issues as we have everywhere else in terms of workforce housing, but we also have issues in terms of this is the way communities oftentimes build a lot of their monetary wealth is through home ownership. And that becomes difficult, and a lot of times, uh, in some of our, for for some of our tribal members, they have to uh, leave the reservation in order to get uh, the housing that they that they're looking for, the 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 fit, the housing fit, and as a result, that's more dollars that bleed out of the local economy. So with that, that's that's it for my time. So I'll go ahead and pass along. So I mentioned in my opening uh, remarks um, in terms of the Department of State lands and the work we do, uh, I was going to talk, uh, focus on the natural resource management side and the collaboration between the states and, and tribal governments around that issue uh, in terms of the, the context of economic development. Um, I also mentioned our agency has a relatively, uh, I would say, high number of activities in terms of coordinating and consultation with the tribes, for example, in the first few months of this year. I was involved in four separate consultations with four separate uh, tribes, uh, and, and I believe this has a lot to do with just the diversity of the programs that, that our agency oversees. Um, first, and maybe the most visible, is our aquatic resource management program that's responsible for all the removal fill permitting, as well as the protection of the public trust values on state-owned waterways. Uh, second is our real property management program, which uh, is principally around the management of our common school trust lands. Some of you may have heard about the Elliott State Forest recently. That's in the category of those lands. Um, and we oversee the management of, of those lands uh, and have to address cultural resource issues that we, that we find on those lands. Third is the South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve, one of a broad network of national estuary research reserves across uh, the nation that we manage, out of, and that's in Charleston, just outside of Coos Bay, Oregon. And then finally, we oversee the uh, Oregonians Unclaimed Property and Estates Administration for the entire uh, state of Oregon, a consumer protection program. Uh, not much of a natural resource piece there, but that is under our umbrella of responsibilities. You know, when it comes to state and tribal government to government relations, uh, state agencies are directed principally by Oregon Revised Statute 182.164. This is the passed in by the legislature in 2001. Uh, and among a number of things, uh, it uh, fundamentally is to promote positive government to government relations between the states and the tribes. Uh, the Department of State Lands has our own department policy that uh, emulates uh, this statute and the intent of this statute uh, that we that we implement uh, and have been implementing those principles of that statute, I, I believe, for a number of years. Uh, just want to go through quickly some examples of that. One, from an agency-wide perspective, we, along with many other natural resource agencies, participate in the cultural resources and natural resources work groups uh, uh, with the tribes. Uh, I think this has uh, been a very helpful forum uh, to help ensure good coordination and collaboration with tribes when it comes to natural resource issues that we are we're trying to work with and collaborate on in a positive way. Um, specifically in terms of our programs, on our real property management side, the most common nexus uh, for us is the cultural resource reviews that we go through with uh, all of our properties when we are contemplating a uh, sale or uh, actually any kind of lease actions on those properties to make sure that we're not authorizing actions that are potentially in conflict with uh, cultural resource interests and tribal interests on those lands. Um, and we actually, uh, the one, one real a uh, positive thing um, uh, among the many things we did around the Elliott State Forest Project had to do with a very extensive cultural resource investigation that that project triggered um, that we produced that helped document for the first time in a much more thorough way uh, a number of, of resource, um, uh, cultural resource issues on that property. 
In terms of our aquatic resource management uh, program, or removal filling and public trust value protection, you know, we've had a number of higher profile projects in the recent years uh, where I think this collaboration has been very helpful. Uh, the Coyote Island Terminal application from a number of years ago uh, that was uh, uh, at the end denied. We have ongoing work with the Jordan Cove Pacific Connector Pipeline project uh, that continues. Um, and again, our participation on the Natural Resource Work Group I think has been a really positive thing in terms of um, highlighting and, and having conversations around those permitting issues that pop up with our program uh, where they intersect uh, with the cultural resources concerns. Um, and we also have an extensive public review process that's part of our permitting process as well as our proprietary uh, work to ensure we're um, providing an opportunity for tribes to uh, see and understand and comment on any of the activities of the agency. And then uh, finally, just uh, briefly a few piece of information around our South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, we actually have a management commission that has one seat uh, reserved for tribal representation. We have a memorandum of understanding uh, with them where uh, essentially to facilitate a cooperative agreement with exchanges of information and data with a couple of the tribes uh, uh, on the coast. Um, and we also coordinate recently uh, very extensively around some new lands that the uh, reserve has acquired. Um, for cultural reviews around restoration uh, project sites. Um, so I hope it gives you a sense of the diversity uh, re of issues that we deal with around the natural resource management side. Um, I think just, just to close, I think one of, the, one of the challenges and opportunities that us and I think other uh, natural resource agencies that are uh, partly in a regulatory uh, role is to find that, that balance where we can both um, do our, our job and fulfill our mandates around protecting the public interests around uh, what's important to the state, uh, state of Oregon overall in a way that uh, will also help ensure that rural economic development moves forward, you know, at a minimum, ensuring it doesn't get in the way and hopefully at the other end of the positive spectrum can actually help uh, facilitate it. So that's, I know that's a goal that we and I actually mention uh, frequently uh, to my staff around that we should keep in front of us uh, as, as we're doing our work. Thank you. We ran out of suits up here, so I said I'd stand and wait and say a few words. Um, Arnie Roblin, state senator um, from Oregon. My district uh, goes from Coos Bay to Tillamook Bay and into Sheridan and Falls City in the Valley, so it's part of seven counties. Um, four of the federally recognized tribes are have reservations within that boundary. Um, and so it's been really important for me. Uh, I, when I first got into the legislature in the House, they uh, I asked for and was assigned to the Commission on Indian Services, which I think is a, a, a really special and unique thing that Oregon did a long time ago. Can't take credit for that. Governor Atia can take, governor, uh, take credit for that. Um, our director is here, uh, Karen Quigley. And I, people who want to have uh, intimate understanding or a person who can help you find intimate understanding of the nine tribes of our state. She is a, a, a major resource for us and uh, that connection between all of the state agencies and our tribes, which is really important. Um, right now there are four legislators, two House members and two um, representatives that are on that. And we see, I think, as a group, as legislators, our job is to help help these tribes become economically um, more independent and, and do the things they need and to recognize um, clearly as legislators, because a lot of legislators do not and a lot of Oregonians don't really understand sovereignty uh, and the unique place that these nations play in our state uh, and the unique relationship that they have with the federal government and we need to make sure that we understand how that works. And it takes time, uh, it takes effort to do that, but right now uh, all of the police forces that the tribes have are trained in Oregon by our same training, and because of a law we passed, which took a little bit of work, uh, they can be peace officers just like our, our people are peace officers on and off the reservation. And I will tell you in rural areas where we have not had enough resources to have public safety, uh, our tribal police are really helpful for those communities to do that. And uh, we've had some really amazing interacting interactions between local police forces in cities and counties and our tribal police forces. And that's been a, a real positive. When it came back for, t it had a sunset date. When it came back for sunset, there was no 
real conversation. The first conversation was a very large and active one because we have two different kinds of tribes in our state, and I think people don't recognize that. They're, all of the Western tribes were um, disbanded, I guess, by the federal government in 1954, uh, and the Celestes were the first to get back, um, uh, made that transition, and the Coke Wills were the last. And that's, I think, happened when I first came there in, like, in the 70s. So it's taken a while to make um, those adjustments and then to figure out what it means to be a sovereign nation within another sovereign, um, the state of Oregon. But together, we can make a difference. And if we respect each other and respect the, the, the common things as well as the unique things that are available in both, I think you can help the economic development of everybody. And I think it's, it's showing in, this, in the work that's being done um, as we look at that. Um, but it's also showing, I think, in legislation that's coming out about uh, our schools, about other ways of doing things. And in my family, I have a, um, a sister-in-law who's part of the James, Jamestown Slalom tribe. I have a niece that's part of the Elwha tribe. I grew up in Port Angeles and knew those tribal things, and I've had the opportunity my whole life. My parents, um, my grandmother was a normal school teacher on the Queets River, and the only way she could get there is her father would drive her to the beach. Um, a Native American person would come down and help her walk and forge the rivers up to the Queets, and then another tribal group would take her in a canoe up to the white reserve, the white settlement on the Queets. She would teach, and the whole reverse would happen at the end of the year. So over a hundred years now, we've been trying to figure out how to work with these unique uh, citizens that have been here for a long time and have an intimate knowledge of our state, much more intimate than our knowledge of that state. So um, I, I would recommend to you a book, uh, the people are dancing again, the Sluts had done, that I got to read a year or so ago. Um, it, it really does give you uh, insights, and I think that the more we know about the other people we live with in this place, and the importance of the land that they live on, and the ancestors who are buried there, the better we'll start to have uh, an appreciation of how to work together. And when you work together, you get a better outcome. And I think that's the thing that all of our tribes are starting to teach us now, uh, and that the Commission on Indian Services is hopefully being a major part of in the legislature. And so our nine tribes have an individual representative, and I will tell you that, just like any other government, once you know one of those tribes, you know one of those tribes. Um, and you've got to keep that in the back of your mind all the time. Just think that when you work something out, and we had, we used to have that a lot. An agency would work out a solution with a tribe, and then they just apply that solution to every one of the others, and that was not really well received. So um, figuring out how to do that and make it seamless so it works is really an advantage to all of our um, economic development in rural areas. I, 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 I can't tell you how much uh, understanding and listening to each other can open the opportunities for economic development in all of our areas. And that's the big message, I hope. And I, heard, I think I heard that theme throughout this group. Um, and then for tribes to be smart enough to take advantage of the expertise that members of their tribes, like our good senator here, um, and bring them back to the tribe, that's really important. Uh, I think one of the things that frightens most of my tribal people that I've talked to, both in Washington and in Oregon, is that what happens when we educate our kids and they leave? How do we get them back? Um, and so we need to have those role models that have gone out, learned, and then come back to add value to their tribes. And that it's pretty exciting to see that kind of stuff happening here. So that's all I have to say. Anything that we can do to help answer questions? I'm going to have to go to the next panel, but I'll let the questions answer because I've got to go down to a board meeting. So. Well, thank you again. Thank you to all of you for uh, staying with us listening. Um, we're going to transition over now to Q&As. What I'm going to do is go mobile around the room, but I just wanted to do a little quick summary of some of the themes that you heard today with regard to the topics. Again, I think Senator Roblin did a great job of, of tying up a lot of those loose ends. But partnership is probably one of those key components. So, um, so I'd like to go around the room. So does anybody have um, a question? Who wants to kick off our questions? I know you have some. Okay, I'm going to come to you. I'll Are you sure? All right. All right. So. I thought you had to go somewhere, but Not okay. Not till 11. <laughs> I've got, got a few more minutes. <laughs> 
Thank you. I'm Senator Marilyn Chase from the State of Washington. I noticed none of the members of the panel addressed the issue of resource, uh, particularly water resources. And I'm, I'm uh, interested in, in Arnie's con uh, uh, remarks that we have to deal with tribes as sovereign nations living within other sovereign nations. And certainly a resource such as water that tr crosses over the boundaries should probably bring a lot of, of consternation and difficulty. I wonder if any of you would care to address that issue. Well, I will just to kick it off. Just, um, so as I had mentioned, um, the affiliated tribes and Northwest Indians, and again, just a little background, because Amber talked about our sister organization, which is ATNI, Economic Development Corporation. Um, ATNI EDC actually started as the tribes, you know, pushed to have a separate organization and entity provide resources and services specific to economic development, because that was one of the leading priorities and still is a leading priority for member tribes. So ATNI represents 60 plus tribes in the Pacific Northwest. We're also a member of the Northwest Energy Coalition, which includes uh, First Nations as well. So that's been sort of our bridge. But to get to your question, uh, some of the priority programming that we provide at ATNI, in addition to economic development, is energy. We have an energy program, which I lead um, in regard, I've worked with Gen Senator McCoy quite a bit on national energy policy with DOE and standing up the Office of Indian Energy um, within the Depart US Department of Energy. Um, we also have a natural resources program and a climate change program as well. So with regard specifically to water, so water in my assessment, and I'm going to take a little step back, is that we in the Pacific Northwest, particularly tribes, not even just in the Northwest, but the nation, um, have really had our conversations around water related to something else. And by that I mean related to infrastructure. Um, water plays a supporting cast character. With regard to talk about you know fish and wildlife restoration and protection, water is a secondary character. Um, the concern is growing as demands are increasing on water resources with the impacts of climate change, um, changes in population growth within basins and sub-basins creates more demand, water quality changes to water quality um, are all concerns. So as a part of that, one of the things we're doing next week, actually, is the first intertribal, and we're taking this as a pilot project here in the Pacific Northwest, but it's the first intertribal water summit where we're focusing specifically on water. Now, I'm an attorney, and my background is in natural resource law. I focused on water law um, through law school. And you know, when you talk about tribal water law, it always goes to the conversation about tribal water rights and adjudication, which falls in the hands of the states that the uh, tribes um, reside in. And for so long, that conversation has been around water rights and adjudication, but there are so many other issues that we're not hitting, particularly um, environmental health, um, looking at the sources of water. I'll take a specific, even dial this, this down to a specific example. Um, my tribe resides on the, is in central Oregon. Uh, one of our borders is the Deschutes River. And so over the years, we've had some ups and downs with relationships in terms of our relationship with the upper basin because we are on the lower basin or the lower end of the Deschutes River. And so water quality issues and water quantity issues become a concern. Um, I recently heard that um, the growth, and, and perhaps you can correct me, um, Mark, but the growth in the city of Bend, which is in the upper portion of the basin, has exceeded the modeling um, that we are at. Uh, I think that what I hear, and you can correct me again, that Bend, the city of Bend is um, populated at what it was forecasted to be 30 years from now. So that presents tremendous strain on our water resources. The other thing our, our tribe is really facing is this um, uh, large algae bloom in Lake Billy Chinook, which we are downriver from and we're drawing our drinking water from. So we, you know, a number of our community members are commenting on the smell and the taste of the water. It's changed. We used to, it's been years since I've been to Lake Billy Chinook, but the last time I was there, I don't remember it being green. <laughs> I remember it being blue. So yes, these are all considerations. So the point of our summit next week is to really look at some of these other issues beyond just water rights adjudication and the traditional scope of tribal Indian water law, to look at um, climate change, ocean acidification. Um, we're taking this approach, and we thought, how are we going to take this conversation and make it digestible. Because when you look at water for all of us, but particularly for tribes, because tribal communities are so complex, um, 
we decide to take a summit to sea approach. Let's follow this conversation from the headwaters down out to the ocean. So we're really looking to work. Um, this is really primarily our outcomes are going to be focused on Oregon. We hope to next year take it to the region. I've already had the University of Washington um, say we want to host it next year because the University of Oregon obviously is hosting it this year. But yes, this is something that we're working on um, this year and next week is when we're going to we're going to start this first conversation. So.